You're listening to the Free of Free of Free of Free of Music podcast. To the Free of Music podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Free of Music podcast. In this episode, I sit down with Mackenzie Page. Mackenzie Page is actually a repeat guest. The first so far. And she was featured in an early episode with the band Gypsy Moon, where she was the lead singer. She is now working on her solo act and just working in the studio. So we have yet to get our hands on the tracks. But Mackenzie talks about some of her creative process, and I am certainly looking forward to what is coming out soon. So stay tuned and enjoy. Um, I'm Mackenzie Page, and I have been working on my first solo record, which will be out hopefully in May. The dates keep getting pushed back, as does everything in the creative world. So May is my May is my day. Um, and yeah, so in the last two years, I've just been writing and traveling, and really just kind of going inward a little bit before. You come back out. It's very important. Nice. And yeah. you are based out of Louisville. Louisville. Well, Colorado. Boulder, pretty much. Yeah. Boulder, Colorado. All right. <laughs> and where are you from initially? Um, I grew up in northern Colorado. Okay. Yeah. So, like outside of Fort Collins, pretty much. Nice. Yeah. And where have you been traveling in recent um, times? Uh, the last, gosh, when was that? So, right after the band split, I went and lived in Oregon for a while. And then I went to Thailand for a couple months, and wow. then I lived in Spain for about three months. And I think you're referring to Gypsy Moon? Yeah, Gypsy okay. Moon. Yeah, and then, uh, so after after Spain, then I went to Morocco, then I went to Ireland, England, and then I came back, went to Austria, then I came back. Wow. And then I stayed. And you were living in all those places, or were you just I traveling was, through? I was traveling through most of them, like, you know, two weeks here, three weeks there, but Spain I spent three months in, so that was... Like quite some time. Okay. And was it because Spain called to you or why did you um, choose to stay there? I, well, so I, I know Spanish. I'm not fluent by any means, but I really wanted to get better at Spanish. And I found this awesome program that teaches flamenco guitar. Oh, and so I kind of, I've traveled a lot before where I've just wandered and I, this time around, I was like, I want to go with a purpose. I want to kind of have something to anchor me daily in a place. And I want to stay in one place to really just like get the culture, to understand the language more, to just kind of like have a day to day in a, in a place, you know, feel like you live there. That's great. Yeah. So it was, it was the best time ever. Honestly, I would go back any, any moment. And so I could. your daily routine was did that involve flamingo guitar? Are you yeah, taking lessons? So like, yeah, so the lessons are really affordable out there. It was like okay. fifteen bucks an hour or something. And so I would go every day to um a two hour so it was like Monday through Friday, two hour lesson every day. And that was like eleven until twelve one. Then they have siesta there, which is like a real thing. You know, people tell you and then until you go literally from one o'clock to four o'clock, it's kind of a decent amount of the afternoon. Everything's closed. Not like bars necessarily. You can still go get something to eat or something to drink, but any kind of store, like the grocery store, any kind of like thing like that. And so you'd kind of just hang out from one to four. I would usually just practice at the flamenco guitar place. And then um, I did a lot of busking. So a lot of times I'd go out and busk too. I'd make like 10, 12 euros, sometimes 20 euros on a good day. And then I would just go drink wine with my, my friends I made there. I was renting a house with um, four other people from different, part, different countries. There was a guy from France, one from Belgium, and then one from, uh, God, what was, where is he from? I think he was Dutch. Um, so yeah, we would just like meet up in the evenings for wine. And, and that's a huge part of Spanish culture is, you know, they will sit for, you go out to, want, you go out to drinks at five o'clock and you're there till like 11. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's fun. And I, and I definitely have, um, a Spanish friend who still lives there and we would go out a lot and I'd go with his friends and my Spanish is to a point where it's like, I would get the conversation, the conversation would be happening, it'd be so great. And then there's just one moment that it would turn where I wouldn't understand what they were talking about. And then I was like, head. I was gone for a good 20 minutes of the conversation, but they were all so sweet and would always come back and 
And I got to do a lot of fun stuff on the weekends. And cool. so I was in Granada, right. which is kind of in the middle southern part. And it's called Andalusia. So Spain is broken up into regions. And um, they're like cultural regions. So I was in Andalusia, which is really big with flamenco. Cool. Yeah. So, um, I'm just, I want to dive into it a little bit because it sounds like you were playing a lot of guitar while you were in Spain. I was playing you, a lot of guitar. I mean, you're flamenco. In the, in the oh. morning, I assume you woke up a little later because you're up later. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, that's the thing people kind of get going around like 10. Yeah. You know, when you'd make breakfast, we'd all sit out on the patio in the back and, you know, shoot the shit. And then, but, uh, oh, that's fine. I'm like, can yeah, I yeah. curse? Yeah, you can curse. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I used to get in so much trouble on radio shows sometimes. No, no, but, no uh, radio. <laughs> Free open mic. Open mic. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah, um, I play a lot of guitar. Uh, flamenco guitar is the hardest <laughs> form of music. I mean, it's funny, too, because people will be like, oh, you studied for that long. Like, can you play flamenco? I'm like, no, I cannot. Like, I <laughs> very much was such a beginner in that style of music. They have a lot of times different time signatures. Yeah. And just um, the fingering of it, you know, the finger, they do a lot of uh, three finger picking and uh, what they call is a rasgueo, which is like a strumming, yeah, thrum, kind of kind of strumming. And so I was just really learning the basics because for me, I was just looking at music. And after I'd come out of the band, I was like, I want something that's just going to inspire me as a songwriter in a completely different direction in which I'm not, you know, naturally going to make up really. So it's like, what's the weirdest thing I could learn that, you know, is also in the same realm. And yeah, so it was, it was a really great time. Nice. And, and, um, so you've been playing not flamingo guitar, but guitar for mm -hmm. how long have you been playing? Gosh, actually, like not that long. I I picked up the guitar when I got my first guitar when I was 21, actually. Okay. I'm 31 now. And you know, the your first couple years playing guitar aren't really that productive because you just really are trying to get the grasp of the instrument and moving your fingers. And, you, you know, I didn't practice that much when I was younger. But uh, I got really serious with it when the, when the band started, which was like 2013. So I was probably like 22 or 23. Nice. And then, yeah. So from there, <clears throat> I got really lucky because the guys in the band were all really proficient at their instruments, like quite masters at their yeah. instruments. So... They, you know, when you're just surrounded by people who are really good at what they do, you just, you know, there's no choice for you except to just like learn on steroids, <laughs> learn, learn on speed, you know, as fast as you can. Because you're like, I got to keep up. Absolutely. So yeah, that, I got lucky in that sense that I, you know. And, and it sounds like, I mean, it's been part of your path in the music industry is just diving into the deep end. Like 100%. I mean. <laughs> playing alongside Silas and the other guys. I mean, mm -hmm. they are, you know, impressive just watching them play. And it's like, oh, how, yeah. did, you, how did you get there? Like, I remember uh, a few few times watching you guys. Um, there was like some riffs that he was doing. And I was like, whoa, where's he going to go? He like, he lost it. He lost it. And then it and it's like, comes back. And it's like, geez, yeah. how did that happen? It's uh, magical. It's, you know, I can't put it into words. You just have to, to listen. But... Um, Spending so much time in Spain playing guitar, I mean, I feel like you are aiming to obviously step up your guitar game. Yeah, in a, in a certain respect. I mean, for me, my main goal, like I come at music, I came at music through writing. So poetry was the thing that drew me in. And um, before I even learned guitar, I, you know, I was studying poetry in school, in high school, I was obsessed. Like that was my thing. And, and I kept kind of getting flack a little bit in my poetry classes because I was using rhyme, which in, you know, poetry is kind of like a, like a cheap shot sometimes, <laughs> you know, it's because like the easy path. it's the easy path. It's yeah. like the idea is to make the words have rhythm on the page, make that more interesting. So I just, I was like, well, where's this place that I could use this part of me that really just wants to come through. And so I found songwriting and yeah. I was like, that's it. Like, that's what I want to do. And so, yeah, I got lucky by finding those those uh, amazing musicians. But um, as far as like learning guitar, I think my goal is just to expand myself as a writer and to be able to accompany myself in the most successful way possible. Because it's like having, 
I don't know. That was my reason for picking up guitar. Cause I was like, oh, I could just find somebody to play a tune and I'll sing to it and I'll write words to it. And I realized I was like, wow, that's putting like 50% of my creative work and my future into somebody else's hands. You know, that's not me being able to sit there and come like let what's coming through come through in a really successful way. So yeah, I was like, I need to learn this. That's awesome. Yeah. So if I could just kind of um, reflect back uh, a little bit what you're saying and tell me if I'm wrong, but it, uh, in order to like stand alone or to be independent, you felt like you wanted to uh, learn more about the guitar. And is it fair to say that you consider yourself a songwriter first and foremost or a vocalist? First? Probably a songwriter more songwriter. than anything. Okay. And honestly, poet probably more than, you know, and, and that's a new thing I'm getting right back into. You know, you kind of flow with your interests as you grow, I feel like. And, you know, in the past year, I've just been like poetry obsessed. Um, so I, I, yeah, I feel like the independence is really important to me because I was, you know, I was like in college and I'm like, people are busy. People aren't going to have the time I want to sit down and like put into this. And it's, you know, it's just going to be more difficult. I felt rather than me just being able to sit down every day for 10 minutes and attempt to learn the guitar. And I just, like I said, I got lucky because I had people around me pushing me towards that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it was, and you know, bluegrass picks are like the greatest place to learn guitar ever. <laughs> really. Bluegrass what? Picks. Picks. What is that? So a pick is when, a bunch of people get together okay. like a restaurant or a coffee shop and they all kind of play songs that each other knows. There's kind okay. of a bluegrass canon. You see it a lot with Irish music too. There's yeah. like an Irish canon that people all know the songs and they get together and then they just kind of go through all the songs. Bluegrass picking is different because whereas Irish music, they'll sit, they'll play the melody straight through. Everybody plays the melody and then they move on to the next song. But with bluegrass, they like pass what's called solos. So they'll play, somebody will play the head or sing, sing the verse. And then it'll be like the guy to the right's time to do the solos. And then that guy's time to do solos. So it's very, it's very nerve wracking because you're- You're on put, the spot. You're on the spot. And there's yeah. like eight people watching you and playing along to the rhythm at the same time. Plus the other reason why I feel like it's useful is bluegrass tends to be pretty straightforward in its chords. It's not like going up there and learning a jazz tune where there's like 12 different chords you have to follow along with. It's like C, G, and D, and you pretty much kind of figure out where the timing is, and you've played enough times that you can just catch on. So that that really helps. Plus, you know, when people learn that way, you get a really honest sense of rhythm straight off the bat. I find when and, like... And it's fast. Yeah, and when people like sit and learn guitar in their basement, because I teach lessons sometimes now beginner, and I find that like... I always give people a metronome because not having a sense of rhythm is really like the fundamental part to music, really. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And uh, when we had previously met a few years ago when you're still playing with Gypsy Moon uh, or when Gypsy Moon was still playing, yeah. um, uh, you had discussed, you started singing, if I recall correctly, it was around age 16? Maybe. Okay. I like, me. I was like a, I was like a car singer. Okay. Like I did it. Like in your shower. Yeah. And like people, you know, my friends from high school, when they found out I was playing music, they were like, what? Like you never sang, you weren't in choir. You weren't, you weren't doing any of that kind yeah. of stuff before. So I really, I came to it late and I think a decent amount out of fear. You know, I definitely, it's kind of scary opening your mouth and attempting to sing if you're not no brought kidding. up with that. No kidding. And my family's not musical at all. So it was like my hidden secret. And I would, my friend, he would, in high school, he would loan me his guitar and I would take his guitar home at night and sit at my house and, and quietly, <laughs> attempt, in yeah, the quietly attempt to play like hiddenly in the closet. It was very, very uh, interesting kind of way to come at it. But I, I have a friend too, um, Aileen Ario. She, she had a similar experience with singing where she like was scared to do it and just didn't really do it in front of people until, you know, her later years of 19, 20, 21. And I had a very similar kind of experience with it where I was just terrified. Honestly, though, listening to those older recordings, I'm like, no wonder I was terrified. This shit's <laughs> whack. So I'm like, well, shit takes practice. Evolution, that's, evolution. Yeah, and I that's mean, the thing too when people think about singing. They're like, it's this natural God-given talent. And you're like, to a certain extent, yes. 
there is tone. There's your natural bodily tone. Yeah, your vocal but cords like are doing. it's fucking practice. Mm -hmm. it, you have to sit there and practice and to know where your voice is because it's not it's not an instrument like a guitar where you can see what you're doing. That's it's a good very point. internal and mental to have to feel where it's vibrating in your body and And you're also hearing <clears> yourself <throat> in the same area as it's being produced so you're kind of not getting the accurate picture it's 100 percent true like anybody learning to do music and if they ask me advice i'm like listen to yourself record it's, it yeah. it's the most painful thing you'll do and you'll have that self-doubt moment where you're like oh my god why i give up all the things but if you can really get yourself to an early stage of like an objective looking at that that you made like you're going to be so much further along in the end. So we started doing that in Gypsy Moon near the end. We would record our shows yeah. and I would just sit in the back of the van cringing at certain moments. But yeah. then when I would go back the next day and play those shows, I knew those certain moments in which I was maybe flat on a word or a word came out wrong or something like that. And I'd be like conscious of that while I was singing. So it's Absolutely. important. That, uh, that speeds up the, the like learn and feedback. Yeah. Though. Definitely. You know, learn, redo, repeat. Yeah, the, um, the basis of insanity. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think it's a misconception that people have about almost every skill or talent out there that it's a given uh, or it's a natural. Yeah. Um, I think there's so much work that needs to be put in in order to really develop uh, any skill for that matter. But um, in particular, I'm, I'm, you know, I wanted to bring up earlier that... You know, there's basically we don't know much about Robert Johnson, uh, mm. a great blues guitarist, one of the first blues guitarists recorded. Except he sold his soul at the, <laughs> at yeah, the crossroads. At the crossroads, <laughs> yeah, he sold his soul to the devil, uh, apparently. And but I do, I have heard that he used to go to the graveyard at like two or three in the morning and just play. And it sounds almost, I don't, you know, I don't want to make the direct comparison, but it's uh, it's like he was trying to play by himself to try and hone his own playing style and he, he learned things that he otherwise um, would have been perhaps embarrassed to show to a crowd. And by the time he had refined some of those techniques, he came out and everybody was shocked by his improvement because mm. they had heard him playing at whatever open my or open bar nights yeah. you know, or whatever. Um, and he came back like a different player. And that's why people claim that he sold a soul because he just came back a different uh, musician. Yeah. And I think it's all about the time that you put in. So going back to, um, you know, your, your flamingo guitar and immersing yourself in a culture and you took lessons in the morning, then you, you bust in the evening mm -hmm. and then you kind of maybe blew off some steam in the, yeah. in the late evening. <laughs> Pretty much drank wine until <laughs> till the day was done. <laughs> and then repeat it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's so important to, that you took a lesson and then went out there and perhaps practiced it or just honing mm -hmm. different styles. And what, I mean, what advice would you give to somebody else, like a younger musician starting out today that might be trying to uh, develop something and they know that they're not quite there yet mm. and, uh, or they want to pick up a new instrument, but they're nervous because they haven't played it. And I mean, you picked up instruments as an adult and, and that's yeah. not something that everybody can say. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the way I come to it like I've never been afraid to be bad at something, to suck at something. Like it's really, it's kind of a thing that as we get as older and as adults, we kind of have more fear of sucking at stuff and like we should have everything figured out at some point. And I think I was just enough of, like I wanted it bad enough that I didn't care to embarrass myself. Cause that's, I mean, that's the hard part. I think that's what I would tell a younger musician is like, you will have embarrassment and shame. Like that's a big part of any creative, any creative journey, you know? It's like, you will have fear, you will have shame, you will have, you know, fear, fear again, like really, but it's, it's about learning how to take those things with you and to know and honor that those things are part of your journey, but then to also be like, but the music's more important, but like learning it. And, and if you want it bad enough, that's more important. Really, it's just, I think I wanted to be able to accompany myself more than I cared about what other p people thought. Really, and that's kind of like a thing I'm dealing with again, I would say. Like right now, I'm actually, I'm still in lessons with guitar. I pay for guitar lessons by this awesome guy. And um, I'm in a poetry class as well. 
So I think you're just, you're never done learning in life. I mean, for me, it's just that that's like part of my joy in life is just continually searching and like combing through different ideas so that I can, you know, make more stuff. But, um, I, you know, as far as the fear and all of that, like I have a lot of that right now because I'm putting out a new record that's completely different than, than anything Gypsy Moon's ever done. And, you know, it's like, I kind of will have moments where I'm like, oh fuck, like, should I put this out? Probably not. Should I? Uh, I don't know. Like people are going to like it. People are going to hate it. Da, 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 da. And I just have to keep coming back to myself of like, it doesn't fucking matter what people think. Like that isn't my job as an artist. My job as, as an artist has nothing to do past the moment I put something out. And I think that's like important to, to young players too, because it's especially difficult when you're playing live because you're getting a direct feedback. So that's almost like more terrifying because you can see on people's faces if they're digging it or not. As far as that goes, I've played to enough empty rooms to the point where I just am like, whatever, like I don't care really. But like with putting out, cause this record's taken me, it'll, it'll have been a year and like a couple months by the time it's out. And that has been a year of like sitting in my room, just being like, oh my God, I'm so terrified, you know? But at the same time, I ask myself, okay, so like, what if you don't? What if you just give up? Like, what if you didn't do music? Would you still want to do it? Like, you know, asking yourself or like another thing too, I ask myself is like, what if you put this record out and like nothing happens, nobody cares, nothing comes from it. Would you still do it? And I keep coming back to like, yeah, I'd still do it. And honestly, like at this point, I'm like, what's next? Like I'm ready to do the next one because this is in the final mixing stages. So it's yeah. really out of my hands at this point. But I was like, you know, I kept asking myself those specific questions. And I think like, especially if you're going to really like put stuff out there in the creative world, you have to ask yourself like what you want from it. What are you asking your of yourself for it? You know, so it's like with even some of my poems, trying to get some of my poems published right now. And it's like rejection after rejection. And you're just like, comes back and I hit it right back out, you know? And I think that's important just to have this like dogged de determination. And I think that's what got me through learning guitar because it's insanely frustrating. Like people are like, oh, don't you love practicing? I'm like, no, I don't. I don't like sitting there reading tablature or not even tablature, but I'm doing notation right now, like classical stuff. I hate it. I'm like sitting there like, oh, it's like you can feel your brain like sludging through it, trying so hard to make sense of it. And like, I'll do it for like 25 minutes and then be like, all right, I'm done. Like, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to go write a song now. Cause that's the fun part for uh -huh. me. But the practicing part, you know, or like the lessons in flamenco guitar, crazy frustrating. Like I would leave sometimes just being like, fuck this, like yeah, over it, anywhere. like fuck this. And that's why I would go then busk and I'd play old jazz tunes and whatever I wanted. Cause they also, Granada has these like skinny little walkways, gorgeous reverberation from the, from the walls. Oh, nice. It's just like the best. It's like singing with a microphone with that one. Yeah, but, um, you get a natural effect. Yeah, it's it really comes down to like dogged determination to where like people talking shit, pe the shame, the fear, like at some point all of that coming at you, like you still don't care and you'll still make the art that you want to make. And that's it, really. That's great. Yeah. I appreciate that message. <laughs> yeah. And and so I'm just curious like when you're when you're going through a lesson and you're like, god, this sucks. Like because when I, I play a little bit as well, and when I was um, approaching certain things, I'd realize I know it doesn't sound right. Like yeah. it, I, it's wrong. And I hear that it's wrong, but my hands can't make it right. And it's like yeah. a really frustrating loop because you notice the deficiency or the inaccuracy and you try it again, you try it again, and it's like, it's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know... I guess maybe um, you, you said that you took a break and would go write some songs. Do you come straight back to it? Or how do you deal with those moments where you're super frustrated? Yeah, like sometimes I'll only practice for like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I'll, I'll like run vocal scales for 20 minutes. Or re like right now, for instance, last night, I'm working on um, <clears throat> this finger picking Paul Simon. Um, oh, God still crazy after all these years. And literally I got through the first two staffs, which is literally like the intro. It's like four chords, but the way that the chords move, 
they are very, they, it's just like, it's not actual, like, n- n- it's not like, oh, you're playing in A flat minor. It's like, no, it's just like this weird formation of one. So I'm like sitting there. I did it for like 15 minutes and I'll go back again tonight. Yeah. But I think it's like, I've as I've gotten older, the frustration level has kind of calmed down because I know enough now after I've learned so much that I'm like, okay, like it'll come. Like just knowing that you keep kind of chipping away at it, like it'll come. And that's that consistency that's like really important with learning music is you have to be really consistent with it. And and if your fingers aren't getting it, like you have to do it so slow. That's the key is like as slow as you possibly can because then your your physical memory will then take over more. You'll be able to program your physical memory more yeah. by doing it slow. So a lot of times when people learn stuff, they kind of blow through it. Like I used to do that a lot with fiddle tunes or like Irish tunes. And then I would try to do it slow and you mess up a bunch. So it's like, if you can do something really, really slow musically, you know, you got it in your body. Yeah. And, and then you just speed up the tempo just a yeah, little bit Yeah, because that's, that's where you want it. You don't want it in your mind. You want it in your body. You want to be able to like feel work through it not necessarily think through it. Because really, I find there's this awesome book, Effortless Mastery by, God, who is it? Kenny Shepard? Ken Shepard? I'm not sure who it's by. Effortless Mastery. Look it up. It's, it's, and it's, it's a lot about that where it's like the mental mind. It's, it's based off the idea of meditation as well. Same thing. Because when you play, it's the best to get into that meditative state where your body is playing the instrument, not your mind. Like you're feeling through it. And is that book specifically for a musician or is he a musician, the writer? He is. He's a saxophonist. Okay. Is that the right way to say it? Saxophonist. Maybe. Sax player. <laughs> he, he plays the sax. And um, he was like big in the New York scene for a while. And um, yeah, he wrote this. And I think he's a piano player too. Um, but yeah, he just, it's, a, it's really short. It's like a PDF you can get online or I think I got the audio version of it. And it's gorgeous because it's really like implementing meditative practices within the playing of music. And, and a lot of like dealing with the ego too. Because I think that like, you know, musicians come up against ego more than, more than anybody because there is this, like, you have to have an extreme sense of belonging in any creative form. So, you, you know, it's like, I'm meant to be here. Like, even if I mess up, like, I ha- I'm here. My existence matters. Here's my song. Like, that's that weird kind of balance musicians have to play because you do have to have an insane strong sense of belonging. But at the same time, you have to be humble enough to not let that get in the way of the art, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. My other favorite book, which I religiously listen to over and over again, is Elizabeth Gilbert, Big Magic. Have you done it? No, not yet. Oh, my God. I'm going to check out both of those books. I'm not going to lie. Like, it's a little obsessive. Like this is my fourth time this year alone listening to this, this book. This year, we're <laughs> like we're fifteen days into the year. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay. I guess I'm including this like, into 2019. <laughs> well, this is my like, first time again wow, this year. Every other day, literally. I mean, it was two okay. days in the car, and I, I'm already blew through it. They have it at the library. I also go to the library. Yes, nice. um, but. This book, I mean, she talks about that same thing about putting any creative art out there is like you have to have this very extreme sense of belonging so that you can kind of come up against all of that backlash that you may or may not have, you know? And usually you're like more than accepted in the world, you know? Or honestly, (laughs) more than anything, you come up against people who are like, oh, cool. And then they move on with their lives. Like, and that's what I like to tell creative people is like people are kind of too busy to care, but then when they do care, it's like they really care. Yeah. You know, like the people I look up to, the writers, the the people, I'm just like obsessed, you know? But it's like beyond that, other people who put stuff out there, I'm like, oh, cool. That was great. And then you move on, yeah. you know? So, th- so that the backlash helps you. isn't too bad. Yeah, that helps yeah. you as a creator because you're like, yeah. it means everything and it means nothing at all. Like that's the most important like contradictive thinking that you need as an artist as well. It's like you have to put all of your work, all of yourself into these creations and like it is the most important thing to get this line right. Like if this line is not right, like it won't work. Like I have to work so hard on this one line and then you have to go up and play it to a crowd of no one. Eh, doesn't matter, you know? 
yeah. shit, whatever. It's not working on an album. Eh, cut that song. It's out. You know, you have to have this kind of like really balanced sense of contradiction in your mind, I think, to, to work through all of that. Interesting. And to not get down on yourself about it, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, and to not let somebody else judge your value. You're creating your own value. Yeah, and because their opinion isn't... Like, I like to think that there is me and my writing and what I make, and then I put it out there, but there is this threshold of out there and in here. And so anything I put out there is no longer mine. So the opinions on it, the people who love it, who listen to it, that is theirs now. Yeah. You know, it's not mine anymore. Interesting. And that's the important distinction to make because once it's somebody else's, then you have no, like their opinion, whether it be good or bad. It's not about you. It's, it's not about, about it. you. It's not, a, it's not about any, like there's that threshold. You're yeah. like, there's a wall, you know, like you're the creator. That's your job is to create. Your job isn't to like think about other people's ideas about what you've created, really. Well said. Point that you're making that uh, like basically your job as a creator is to create mm -hmm. and is not to react to somebody else's opinion. Uh, and their just opinion is a reaction to your work. So there's no need to react to a reaction. Exactly. So, and it's really tough now in this day and age because of social oh, media. People are loud. And, like and people do that up. on their regular life. Yeah. You know, and it's like. haters too. Yeah, it's, it's really. And I think that point, especially with creators or honestly, anybody who makes anything, like if you're making a business, if you're making this, it's like take feedback with like a humongous grain of salt, you know, and just really like take what feedback resonates with you more than anything. Everything else, it's like, doesn't matter who said it, what, anything. Like, unless the feedback really resonates with you, I mean, I don't know. I, I tend to just like stick it all in a pocket and <laughs> don't really go for it. Yeah. You know, it's like you were asking me like, oh, did you listen to the last interview? I'm like, nope, didn't. Like, even with my albums, like, I don't listen to my albums because I'm not there anymore. Yeah. That's, that's out there. I'm over here on what I'm generating, you know? The next stuff. And out of curiosity, do you, uh, how do you balance that approach of like not taking any feedback, but maybe soliciting a select few friends that you really trust or musicians that you look up to? Or how do you get, um, I, I don't know if it's called feedback or just like creative criticism from people that you will listen to, not necessarily that you're going to act on it. Yeah. But like a sound engineer. Well, or like if I'm working with someone in yeah. a project, that's a completely different experience. Yeah. Like I'm talking about people who haven't been involved in any sp yeah, step of the way, Twitter. you know? Yeah. Or like, you know, your friend who you haven't seen in four years, listen to your album and they like have an opinion about it or something. Like that's what I'm talking about more than like, if I'm like my producer, my engineers, like they're like hand in hand with me on that. And like, I'll be like, what do you think of that line? Like, how is that? Da, da, da. Like I'm very back, like, mm -hmm. or like a band member that I'm working with, like yeah. my drummer, he'll help me with arrangements and like that kind of stuff. I'm very big on, like you need that. You need that as a creator. You need somebody to bounce your stuff off of, but it's very particular upon who you do that. Like yeah. some of my friends, you know, their style of music, like what they listen to isn't my style of music. So I hesitate to show them in a real way because I'm like, you're just going to love it because you love me. But it's like, it's maybe not like you're, like what you would listen to. Like you're super into the Grateful Dead. Like I'm playing like indie music, you know? You're like, it's not your vibe. Mm -hmm. But like my friends who are like, know all the indie bands that I do, I'm like, yo, like I would love your opinion on this. Yeah, and I think it's asking for opinion too, if you need it. And, yeah. and a lot of times like I'll know what, I'll know points of my own work that I'm like, that's not really working. Or like that needs to be tweaked. And if somebody kind of mentions a similar thing I've already had in my head that I'm like, proof, oh, yeah. cool. Second opinion. Yeah, like that's when those those times make sense, even if the person hasn't been in the project. It's like, oh, you definitely hit on something I also noticed. Because it yep. it's important to have feedback in that way, you know, because you are creating a thing for people. But I think like just because of our nature with social media and where we are as a society, like that's a really you know, temperamental thing. And like, you have to make sure who you're getting your feedback from, like 
just be very particular about it, I guess. And not just, you know, like, oh, I only got so many comments on this photo, but I got a bunch on this video. Like, why is this, you know, that kind of shit. And you just, that's like, you can't. Yeah. You just got to like put it out there and (laughs) move on to the next thing, I guess. Yeah. So I wanted to go back uh, earlier. You were talking about your college days. I'm just curious. What did you study? Poetry. Poetry. Yeah. You majored in poetry. I did. I didn't. I did. Where did you go to school? See you. Okay. Yeah, I majored in poetry and minored in philosophy. Okay. My poor dad, he was like, what are you doing? Like, I'm going to be a lawyer. Don't worry about it, dad. But (laughs) oddly enough, like I'm using it, you know? Yeah, And I actually graduated with philosophy degree. Oh, nice. But. Yeah, I quit after I, I just I was gonna double degree, but then I was like, no. That's a after lot. like all my logic classes, I was like, I'm over oh, this. Logic was rough. Over this, it's not the kind of philosophy I was like. Oh, I should have been a religious major study. Like that would have made more sense for the basis in which why I was interested in philosophy mm-hmm. was like the contemplation of ideologies and like why we hold them. And you know, philosophy just got like so argument heavy about crafting the correct argument that I was just like, no. I'm just going to focus on poetry now. So, yeah, I actually graduated with a poetry degree. Great, great. Yeah, very strange. So I wanted to touch on like a like a, a theme, which I feel like you are embracing and living out. And that is like kind of uh, changing with change uh, or mm. overcoming uh, circumstances Um I'm trying to word it better, but it's That's not good. it's not coming. <laughs> you're all good. Like you're meaning like change when your life changes and Yeah, or like let's say uh Gypsy Moon um broke up or like mm-hmm. the band is no longer playing together. Mm-hmm. Now somebody else might have uh said, Well, shoot, now it's all over. Now I gotta get a day job or uh do you know yeah. something totally different. But you're kind of embracing the change, you're putting out a new album and you're you're kind of um evolving with with time over time yeah i mean that ending was really quite like intense for me because i kind of just like left everything and (laughs) moved to oregon i did i just i like dipped out i was supposed to be at a wedding i was supposed to do all this stuff and after our last show i just like kind of left and then i left the country so in a big way like i needed to kind of I guess, find myself again. Cause when you're in a project like that, and I was in a relationship as well inside that project, it defines you in a lot of ways that when you define yourself by something outside of yourself, which we all kind of end up naturally doing, oh, I'm a firefighter. Oh, I'm a teacher. Oh, I am a this. It's when you lose that, there is, and not only that, but like I kind of at the same time was like out of a relationship, I moved, I did all this stuff within a month. And so it's like when all of your defining factors have then left you and you're just like left with yourself, it's, it, it was as difficult as that moment was for me. It was probably the best experience I've had to go through because it really made me go inside myself and say like, what is this that you want? What is this that you want from life? And that's, I think that's the way change affects people a lot. And really... More the best thing you can do for yourself is like get used to it, you know, get used to the constant motion, the constant change, because that is the only thing you can actually count on. That and your own death. Those are the only two things you can actually count on. And the more comfortable you get with those, because that, those are like two of base human nature fears. Like we fear death and we fear change yeah. because of comfort levels and everything. So it's like, I saw that as like my fast paced schooling on how to deal with it. And, and, you know, you talk about like the job literally yesterday, I was like, fuck, I should get a real job. Like, I guess that maybe I should get a real job, <laughs> you know? And, well, and doubts creep in. Yeah. And like, I think especially as musicians too, and the new, the new day and age of, of music, it's, you know, a lot of people have multiple streams of income. Yeah. Like most of my friends who play music have multiple streams of income. And like right now I do. But it's like, I think, you know, the more, the more you can get comfortable with that. Because even if I were to get a real job, say, okay, so like, say I go back and get my teaching license because I want to be, the only other thing I could ever think I would want to be is like a professor Mm -hmm. teaching kids how to write poetry. Maybe not kids, but like adults or young adults. 
<clears throat> and I'm like, okay. So then I would have to go back to school more debt. Then I would have to, after that, I would like have to find a job in a university, which is actually just as difficult, honestly, as being a musician. Like a lot of the things I could see myself doing, like recently I've been like, ooh, maybe I'll just try to like somehow figure out how to be an editor because I love reading and I love correcting. So I've been like researching that and I'm like, could that be a side hustle? You know, I think it's about finding like the right side hustles to like keep keep your, because for me, it's like whatever I can do, like here's my creative spirit. Here's my music, my writing. I am in service to you, writing world. And I'm like, whatever I can do, whatever hustle I can make happen to make that life happen is the key for me, is the goal. So it's like, I was bartender all last year. You know, I've, I've done babysitting. I've done landscaping. <laughs> I've done everything. I've trimmed weed for days on end, you know? Like I go out to California and do the hustle. I've done a lot of different shit. And it's like, sometimes I feel the societal anxiety from that of like, oh shit, like my resume sucks. Like I've never had a real job. I've never like, did I pay taxes, all the things, but I, you know, as far as like, if I were to be a hireable candidate, not so much. It depends on who's looking. Exactly. I mean, and, and really in the grand scheme of things, I'm like, oh, you've like created and hosted your own festival and you've also what festival? had- What festival? I was Festival of the Muses. Okay. That was two years ago. All right, I don't want to slow you down. But what else have you done? Keep, well, keep, I mean, running a band is going. running a business essentially. Oh, yeah, yeah, so it's like, yeah, so it's like those businesses. kind of things. Yeah, it's like- really on that front, it's it's just as reputable as a thing. So trust me, I go back and forth every day. I'm like, should I get a real job? Should I get a real job? And then I'm like, well, but at the same time, I'm always just going to keep doing this. So shit, why not? I mean, a big part of me questioning that is because like life on the road is really difficult. And as much as I absolutely adore traveling, like touring is a different thing than traveling. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you, with Gypsy Moon, you're touring a lot. Uh, you just recently popped around a bunch of different uh, cities and countries, mm-hmm. and you made the conscious choice of I want to go to Spain and stay mm. and learn. And so, what I mean, I think we all kind of fantasize about traveling, and then once you start traveling a lot, you're like, damn, I really want a home base, um, or I yeah. just I don't want to spend my time moving. I want, I like seeing new things, but like, why keep moving? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just curious about how you uh, find balance in, in touring and, and traveling and your art mm. and living in general. Yeah, I mean, when we were touring, like we'd come home and I was a straight hermit. Like I wouldn't leave the house land because we lived up in Eldora, which was just gorgeous out in, you know, nature, mountains, 9,000 feet. <clears throat> it was like I wouldn't leave there for like a week. Like I just would stay home. It was really funny because my friend was just making fun of me on the phone on my way over here to call me a hermit. And it's like, I just kind of do that. Like I go through these phases of like super hermit and then super out there, super hermit, super out there. And I think that's, I learned that from touring. Because when you're touring, you're not only like, are you always on? Like you're always meeting people. You're always talking to people. You're like here and there. You're always with people because of your bandmates, you're in the car, you're here, you're there, you're eating with them. You're, it's everything. And there's no break. Yeah. And like, that's really t- intense, you know? And I think we had a lot of like, you know, emotional differences and stuff that made that even more difficult. So, you know, it's, we are also st- all young too. It's like, we can't blame ourselves for our past faults, really. All you can do is learn yeah. from that shit. And I think one of my fears of getting back into music was that, was that touring lifestyle? And like, can I do that again? How can I do that in a different way? Maybe there's another, you know, and I'm still kind of learning that right now. I'm still coming up against that. Like, okay, how am I going to structure this now? How am I going to go on tour? Cause it's inevitable. You have to tour. But, um, I think I recently kind of stopped drinking. That's my main thing as well. Alcohol is like, for you, a huge, you know, and it's a, it's a day-to-day battle. And sometimes I fall off the wagon and I get back on the wagon. I'm like, okay, I swear to God, I'm done this time. And I'm like, shit, yeah. back on. And I'm just really focusing on finding a really nice balance with that because that was, I think, what made our whole situation and Gypsy Moon very difficult as we like love to party together, you know? And like the road is full of parties. 
and you're always expected <laughs> to party, really. I mean, like what other job is like drinking on the job expected? Do you know what I mean? Like that's the craziest thing a musician has to come up against, really. It's like you are supplying the good time. And so within yourself, it's like really important to find that balance of like, and honestly, I find when I'm like sober and playing, I'm much better. I'm more fun. I have a better time. Like it's, yeah. it's all the things. So it's kind of my, my newest goal. So I think when I do tour, I'm going to tour sober. Good for you. That's a, yeah. That's Cause a, then you like sleep, you keep your voice, it's all the things. <laughs> nice. yeah. Yeah, all the benefits, your all the benefits, your the energy. Morning. Yeah. You enjoy yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's the you key. Drive home. Yeah. And then really finding balances for yourself because also in Gypsy Moon, we had that kind of like, like, er, we got this, we got to do all the things, we got to do all the things. So we were always available. Okay. Like shows would come up and we'd be like, get the show, get the show, get the show. I'm going to do it next time where it's like, I'm taking that month off. Like I'm going to another country and I'm going to live there for that time. Because really like, it was so cheap to live in Spain. Holy shit. So cheap. Like... I think I spent like two grand in three months, like including my rent and food and lessons and wow. all the things. Like yeah. it is very affordable. America's heart is very expensive. Yes, it is. As far as the country goes. Well, that's, that's, yeah. Uh, Whoa. Yeah. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, glad and, you know, excited for you. And I, yeah, I can't, too. can't wait for the new album. I'm and, so excited. Uh, you know, I'll have to, Check your tour dates once they're out. And, yeah. And people can find uh, the album and your tour dates on your website. Yep, MackenziePageMusic.com. And then I'm, I haven't put my Facebook out there yet, so I'm working on that. Okay. It's funny because it's like you we always had website. a we, yeah we always had a Gypsy Moon one, and I never made like a personal one. But I'm getting to the point where I'm like friends with so many strangers on Facebook that I'm just like, dude, I gotta like. It's the wall again. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. I need to put that up and get my Facebook going. So that's one nice. of my things I'm working on. Um, so yeah. one, one last uh, thing that I kind of wanted to bring up is just the approach of learning. So mm. of how you are able to learn new instruments really fast, uh, learn new styles of the same instrument like flamingo guitar and, and why – it is important to you to still be learning and you still have a teacher, you have several teachers mm -hmm. and you know, what is it? And I would call it a growth mindset. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to stay on the path and not pretend like there's nothing to be learned because there always is. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it comes from a general, <laughs> it's kind of bad, but I like get easily bored. Yeah. So if I'm not like keeping my brain active, like I have a, I have a brain like a border collie and if it's not like actively working on something or thinking about something, it's usually like over here messing stuff up. That's, that's like Elizabeth Gilbert actually said that and I was like, oh my God, that's me. Brain like a border collie. If it's not creating, it's destroying. <laughs> so it's, you know, I think that's really a true, a true part of my brain and I think that's why I keep learning because otherwise I just kind of get bored, really. And it's why I kind of go for other, you know, I paint sometimes and I'll write poetry and then I'll come back and then I'll write a song. And it's like keeping it mixed up like that just keeps me entertained, really. And kind of just uh, feeding your passion uh, and creativity and following what's inspiring you at the yeah. moment. Yeah, it just makes me happy to be in that space. I mean, that's what... Um, they talk about a lot in effortless mastery is like finding that space of like calm, meditative joy, you know, where you really are in that moment when you're in the moment itself. And, you know, there's nothing outside of that moment tugging at you and you're paying attention and you're happy and you're involved and time goes away. And like that for me is that creative space. So like However I can get there in whatever form as often as I can, that's what keeps me coming back. Because it's it's like better than drugs, really. It's the happiest you'll. You, I mean, I've I've been is, you know, when you get that perfect line to the end of that song and you're so excited and you're dancing around your room, and you're like, oh, I love this so much. You know, that's that's what keeps me coming back to it, really. Great. Yeah. And do you have a daily meditation practice? I do. I meditate every day. Uh, can you every tell morning. me a little bit about it? Like, is it? Uh, do you have a mantra? I do. I have a mantra. I started with a mantra. Um, 
I sit every morning. So like I'll wake up, I'll go down, I'll turn the coffee on. And then I go back upstairs and I set a timer, which is the, the most important thing I've done for myself recently is I bought a kitchen timer. Cause like what would end up happening is I was using my phone and I would like find myself on Instagram for like 20 minutes and be like, what are you doing? Like you're supposed to be meditating right yeah. now. So I bought myself a little kitchen timer and I set it for 15 minutes. A timer is always extremely important meditation. Like don't sit down and meditate without a timer because that's the thing that'll keep you coming back is knowing this will end. This moment does end. Like I'm going to sit down, I'm going to do this, but it ends. You know, if you just have this endless meditation time where you're like, it'll stand up when I feel it. It's like, you're never going to do it. It's not going to be a consistent practice. Sometimes I do that with music too. I'll be like, and 20 minute timer, boom, practice. Nice. Because it's like having that end time makes you want to do it more. So I meditate for 15 minutes. I have a mantra. My mantra is, I guess I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, it's quite private, but oh, well, <laughs> if it yeah. helps people, yeah. you know, then yeah, I don't, the cool. that's the thing. So um, I sit down and I say, everything is always working out for me. Right. Everything is that's always beautiful. working out for me. Everything is always working out for me in my head for like 15 minutes, literally. Yeah. And um, it helps too if you listen to like the heater, like a consistent noise. There's outside. always something out there yeah, there's, making noise. Yeah, because that'll bring you really into the present moment. Yeah. It's like listening to what's happening in the moment. And then after that, I do what's called the morning pages. So then I go get my coffee. Then I go into my my office and I sit and I set another timer <laughs> for 20 minutes and I write whatever comes to mind. Mm -hmm. That's a Julie Cameron, the artist's way tactic. Okay. Have you read that? No, I haven't, but I do <sighs> have morning pages. It's the app, right? Morning pages app? No, I actually sit down with a notebook and oh, I, okay. I like physical, physical right. notebook right. and I write. Okay. So Julie Cameron has this book called The Artist's Way and it's, oh, it's a fantastic, it's like a 12 week program about, um, it helps with people who have like creative blocks, writer's block, who just feel like they're not, they're stuck creatively, they don't feel creative, mm -hmm. maybe they don't think they're, they're creative, that's another option. So if you read this book, it's a 12 step, one, you do it once a week, and so her main thing, one of the first lessons is the morning pages. And it's kind of sitting down and just letting yourself, like I have a separate notebook for this that I show absolutely no one. Mm -hmm. And it's literally like, good morning, morning pages. Today I have to do this and this and this and this. And I got to go to the grocery store. And oh, I was feeling so annoyed last night about this and this and this. But then I really came through, da, 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 like whatever comes through. Like yeah. even if you can't think of something to write, just, just write, 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 the word write, the word write. Oh, I'm writing right. Oh, I'm writing right. Right. I'm sort of like just letting it flow out of you. Cause that allows you to really like get beyond your judgment mind and into allowing yourself to, to physically write. It's a very physical motion. But so I do that every morning and then I like go about my day, nice. exercise, all and, the things. And when you, let's, let's go through like an ideal day, you know, as if there was such a thing, um, you know, arguably every day is ideal. <laughs> every day is ideal. But, uh, you know, in an ideal day when you're, when you're feeling very creative and you're productive, uh, you would wake up, start the coffee, start a meditation, then do your mor morning pages. Mm -hmm. How would, uh, when do you approach art or poetry or? Well, then recording? I would like answer emails and do that kind of stuff, like office y kind of things that I need to get to. And then I'll usually like go out on a hike, take the dogs for a walk, exercise in some form. Then I'll usually have some like middle thing to do, kind of middle day thing to do. And honestly, where I create the most is at night. So, like, it'll be like, oh, I just went out to happy hour with my girlfriend, came back. Now I'm in my space, in my room, and I'll stay up to like two or three in the morning creating and writing. That's like, that's for me the time. Actually, I've, I hear a lot of people say they do that. And <clears throat> I love the theory I've heard about that okay. is because um, most people were sleeping then. So yeah, like yeah. the, the mental airwaves are like clearer. Ooh, ooh. So like you're more Mystical. apt to grab ideas when there's less people thinking in the space. That's interesting. It's very interesting. Are, are your roommates asleep generally at that time? Um, you get some quiet and so peace at home? or I don't, I suppose, <laughs> that's funny. So like my life is very different every day. Like okay. I don't yeah. have, that's why those practices are so important to me because they're like the only consistency like I really have in life. And my roommates, besides one of my roommates is, is quite similar. Like every day is different for everybody. So I just, that was, that was a hard part about living with people for me is because I like, don't like people to listen to me when I'm 
practicing or mm-hmm. writing. So I'll find little snippets of time where there's nobody in the house and I'll be like, oh, that's my time, that's my time. So that's when I'll like work on singing a tune I'm maybe not so confident about. But when it comes to writing, like I don't care who's around. Like I just shut my door. Yeah. That's it. And nobody's going to see what you're writing. Exactly. Or if I'm like humming or playing a small thing on the, you know, and then eventually I'll get so deep in the writing that I just forget like that people could hear me per se. And they usually never do. Or if they do, it's like, Ooh. so it's not yeah, like. Yeah, it's a muffled in the back, yeah. two rooms. I mean, deep. that's the thing. And then I then I hit that point we were talking about before. It was like, I just don't care because what I care about is I need to create. So like whatever else, anybody's opinions, whatever they're hearing, if it's good or bad, like I don't care because that's, I'm not going to let that dumb shit get in the way of the song that I need to write, you know? Yeah. It's really, it's becoming like a protective mother of your creativity. You're just like, like, I don't care. Like, get out of my way. Yeah. I'm going to do this and it doesn't. And, and nurturing, it's like, a, like yeah. a kindling of a fire. You got to, you got to start it a little bit, but then you got to like blow on it, add the next yeah. stick, add the next little But then twig. also the balance is to, because a lot of people will be like, oh, my creativity is my baby or my book is my baby or my song's my baby. But then like, you can't think of it like that either because sometimes you have to cut it and that means like killing it yeah. essentially. So you have to be willing to do that as well with it. I think it's just, yeah, that's the the mothering sense of just willing to do whatever it fucking takes to make that shit happen. And, and when do you draw the line like, Damn it! I tried hard for two weeks on this song, but it's just not up, I mean, up to the standard. I sometimes think I give in too easily to that notion of like, "fuck it, I'm out," you uh-huh. know. But there's this cool idea in that Elizabeth Gilbert book that like Tom Waits is he'll have trouble with a song, and like one song, like they'll be through a whole album, and there will be one song that just like isn't getting on board, and he'll like kick everybody out of the studio and have a conversation with the song. Like, look, everybody's in the car, and you're like, if you're not gonna come, you're not gonna come. Like this, I'm warning you. Like, I will leave you. Like, I will leave you here. You won't get made if you come back later. That's your thing. Like, I'm I'm in. You're in or I'm out, kind of thing. So yeah. I think that there's a lot of that. I could get better at that kind of conversation. For me, I'm kind of like, eh, fuck it. I'll just write a new one. Yeah. Because I I never fear that the creative well will drive with me. Yeah. Like I never have that fear. I've, I I hear people have that fear sometimes, and I'm it just for some reason it makes no sense to me. I'm like, if you did that once, what's to say you couldn't do it again? Like why why would you know, the beings that are creators giving us creations stop, you know? And and that's the other thing I love about that book of Big Magic. She's just really big on like, you are the worker and spirit is the giver. So if you're not sitting down and doing your work every day, your spirit is going to be like, the fuck girl? Like I'm trying to give you songs, but like you're too busy out there like partying to really hear So until you sit down and I see you like diligently working towards that, like, you know, actually putting the time in, then I'm not going to come visit you. And then inspirational visit and you're like, woo. So yeah, that's, that's the best book though. Seriously. Okay. (laughs) She understands it so much. And that's like, when you find someone who really understands what you go through too, it's like, hell yeah. Great. And um, basically the last question I want to leave up to you. It's open-ended. Is there anything else you'd like to share about the upcoming album? Uh, any, you know, any thoughts in general that you'd like to share or imparting wisdom that you'd like to leave with the listener? <laughs> there is a CD release show we're going to have on May 8th. So coming up, it, um, it's called The Broadway on Roxy. <laughs> Roxy on Broadway. The Roxy on Broadway. Um, it used to be Syntax in Denver. Okay. So it's like right off Colfax and Broadway, the Roxy. If you look up the Rock, there's two Roxies. So this is the Roxy on Broadway. Okay. But it's a really swanky little club. It fits like 100 people at most, maybe. So it'll be a nice tight thing and just like a door cover deal. And the Copper Children will be with us. They're a great band who should totally do a podcast with. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they're awesome. They're like an up and coming band. Yeah, yeah. I, in the I Denver. Know of them. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, so they'll be there. They'll be there. And actually, I'm so excited. I hope this works out. I'm going to say it just so that it helps it manifest. But David Matters, who was, um, who's in a band called Life Like Water, and they just put out their first record, but he used to be in the first formation of Gypsy Moon. 
So he's going to come out. And so we'll do some old Gypsy Moon songs, like from the first record, old school Gypsy Moon songs. And uh, so he'll be out and he'll be doing a little solo opener set and hustling his album for his band Life Like Water, which is gorgeous. Everybody should listen to it. Yeah, so I'm really, I'm like, I want that to happen so bad, so. Nice. And and do you have a title yet for the album? I do, but I'm not going to tell okay, you it's yet. A, it's a, it's... Stay tuned. Uh, MackenziePage.com. <laughs> yes, Mackenzie Page uh, Music. MackenziePageMusic.com, yes, correction. Because Mackenzie Page is a wonderful interior designer. Ah. Has the same name as me, well, so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Mackenzie Page music. So, um, and you're going to be singing on the record. You'll be playing guitar. Uh, I played most all of the instruments except there is some piano, drums, and bass. But everything okay. else I played. And and what are the? Uh... Uh, guitar, tenor, banjo, tenor guitar, pretty much it. Nice. And vocals. And yep. I wrote all the songs. So that's awesome. Well, <laughs> it was yeah. You'll have to stay tuned. And yeah. uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you to for having me so me much. I appreciate it. It's a good little conversation. You've been listening to the Frio Music Podcast with Michael Morahan. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. And don't forget to share this podcast everywhere. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay tuned. You are listening to Frio Music. Stay tuned.